Hello. Now, first of all, you may hear a bit of a buzzing. I have the fans on. We're reaching 90 degree weather. So, <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> now, this video is actually a re recording. Um, it's for the 20th anniversary of Gladiator. Yeah, the audio was really bad on that one, and I didn't realize just how bad it was. So I want to do it again, even though it's the 22-year anniversary, but um, we're just going to say it's still 20 years. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm trying to save your ears here, <laughs> make it listenable. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize it was that bad. So, oh my gosh, we all know that I love this movie, and boy, do I ever, as if Newsies wasn't bad enough. But here's the, here's the thing about Gladiator, is when it was released, you have to understand that there were so many of those teen movies people were still also pretty drunk on titanic i mean <laughs> and when it comes to like the time period like the ancient type in the uh, time period that gladiator was released you didn't really see that in anything else other than the mini series that were uh going and i'll touch on that in a second but the oh man the teen movies you know i have nothing against clueless i've seen it a couple times i have nothing wrong with it or anything it's not really my type of movie <laughs> my mom really likes it but not me but here, here's the thing is there were so many of those movies that's why the movie Not Another Teen Movie was made. <laughs> it's like, just stop. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they overkilled on those movies. And not saying that the movies weren't great, but they needed, they just need to stop. <laughs> Give us something else for a change. And they finally did. Now, as for the miniseries, the, the thing about miniseries is they kind of, well, they did. They, they died out uh, probably around 2003 because, of course, they made those televisions where you, I don't remember what they were called. They were a specific type of television and you could record and now, of course, we have this whole system. Yeah, it, it's yeah this ancient technology. But the idea of recording programs onto your television or VCR, anyway. And so, and now, of course, we have all the technology that we have now. And <laughs> it was the progression up to now. And but yeah, it seems like there was a specific TV that you had to buy and you could uh, record. Because I remember my dance teacher, she talked about it. She had just bought that specific and when she was really excited. She was like, yeah, I'm going to record this program and this program and everything. And there were only specific, uh, like a, um, a certain amount and so she's like when I get home they're going to be there and I'm going to eat dinner and they're going to be there. <laughs> now it's unlimited oh good heavens but but with the mini series uh that's pretty much where it died out now the mini series the first one I remember I was trying to think back and the first one I remember is Scarlet Scarlet was the uh the sequel to gone with the wind and i'm not a fan of gone with the wind i, I read the book and it was so boring i uh, and i mean there were things in the book that just did not make sense it it was like why is this even here 
<laughs> and everything. And but you know, it, it's important. I get it. It, it. it was an important and and all of that. This is it's one of those things where the movie was a thousand billion times better than the book, in my opinion. <laughs> and I can have that. But as for Scarlet, it, it had a lot of big names. I remember Timothy Dalton played Rhett Butler and Aunt Margaret was in it too. And but um I just remember that came out when I was in middle school. And I remember uh teachers were confiscating the book <laughs> from kids because it was inappropriate. And so they had to and um and then, of course, they were going on through high school, and I've talked about the Titanic miniseries that came out the year before James Cameron's movie. There were also, uh, I believe, the Patrick Stewart Moby Dick uh, was a miniseries, not an actual movie. And that's a good one. And there was, of course... 10th Kingdom, which is, if you haven't seen it, you have got to see it. I mean, it's got tons of big names in it. Uh, Warwick Davis is in it. Uh, Ed O'Neill is in it. I always forget that he's in it, but it, yeah, he's in it and um, just lots of big names. And But there's, there was also Jason and the Argonauts and uh, there was the Odyssey. The Odyssey was a good one. Jason and the Argonauts was okay, but but my point is that we had these mini series, and like I said, with the time period that Gladiator was in, we usually just saw it in these mini series. Jason and the Argonauts and the Odyssey being a good example. People were very. They were. I don't know when. I guess it kind of died down when Gladiator came out. You know, it's like you have these big hits that come out, you know, because you have uh, um, Braveheart. Braveheart was a, a big hit. They were, sh they were showing that on TV, I remember, and they had to cut out a lot, of course. I remember watching that with my mom. And, uh, yeah, they would... <laughs> And and she would be like, oh, oh, turn away. Oh, no, they cut that out. It was like, it's TV, Mom. <laughs> and of course they're going to cut that. <laughs> and everything. So you had, and that one came out in 1995. Two years later, you had Titanic. This, this big, big hit. And which made this huge revival for uh, Edwardian era, and which hadn't really happened since Titanic was found. And before that, there was like a, a movie from the 70s that was also uh, a revival of Edwardian. So, but anyway, then Gladiator comes out in 2000. And... I mean, like, <laughs> this was my introduction to Russell Crowe. Now, of course, he had been in movies forever. And <laughs> he also has a band, and or he did back and, and everything. So uh, back, I don't know how far back, uh, I don't want to say the 70s and sound ignorant or anything, but <laughs> knowing me, it could have been the early 80s. But, um, you know, and, and that's the thing that really gets me is when people find out that uh, actors have uh, a, a music, you know, that Ricky Gervais was in, <laughs> he, he was in a band. <laughs> Like it's, uh, yeah, he, he did that for a while. I think that's, that was the start of it and, and everything. And um, 
And then Robert Downey Jr. I remember when Robert Downey Jr. released uh, his album back in 1994. Yeah, uh, Robert Downey Jr. had a music career for a while. Bruce Willis. I actually found a um, a single with Bruce Willis, and because I had completely forgotten that was back in the 80s. And then, of course, uh, not too long ago, uh, it's probably been about three years ago now, uh, knowing my timeline, <laughs> Eddie Murphy in the 80s. Yeah, people were bringing that up again. And I remember in the 90s when Michael Jackson tried to revive that, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. So yeah, there are actors that <laughs> they they can sing. <laughs> I'm not sure why this is like a mind blown thing. It, I'm why why are you? But <laughs> so yeah. But this this was my introduction to Russell Crowe, and it it wasn't like I watched it, and I was just like. Uh, he was like my new crush or anything like that. No, I just, I was impressed by his performance and everything. And <laughs> yeah, you can watch somebody and be impressed by their performance and be a fan of them and not find them attractive or anything. Not saying that he wasn't attractive or anything. And... <laughs> And of course, the soundtrack is just, I, I have nothing bad to say about Hans Zimmer's uh, music for this. And, but I find it funny that people are like, oh my gosh, he, re he recycled Gladiator for Pirates of the Caribbean. This is what I have to say about this, you know, as a musician. You do understand that this is not a new Mozart <laughs> recycled. When you listen to, to Mozart, okay, find the Amadeus soundtrack because that's just all Mozart. And duh. <laughs> it's about Amadeus Mozart. But just sit down and, and listen, and you realize that he recycled his own music. That's what he did. <laughs> um, Henry Mancini did that. You know, his one of his more famous is the Pink Panther. And uh, then you look at <laughs> Breakfast at Tiffany's. Now, there's both of those have a party song. They sound the same. <laughs> Look, I love Henry Mancini. He's one of my favorite composers. But I got to tell you, <laughs> he's like on a lot. Well, he is. He's on a lot of albums from the 60s and 70s. And I think he started in the 50s. And when you start listening, you realize that there were certain pieces that were... <laughs> that are the same and that party song <laughs> is the same <laughs> oh nobody will notice i know this buddy <laughs> and alan menken i'm sorry love the guy he's no he's on several of the disney's that you know like little mermaid beauty and the beast aladdin if you actually listen <laughs> Yeah, I, I hate to break it to you. And so, and uh, there was also another one, uh, Alvin, I mean, Alvin, uh, Alan Silvis, Silvestri. Now he did The Mummy Returns. He, he's the composer for The Mummy Returns. Now he also was the composer for Flight of the Navigator. Now I have... Flight of the Navigator. So I was listening to it not too long ago, and then I went back to The Mummy Returns, and there are bits and pieces that are the same. 
<laughs> which makes sense, especially when you have the undead army. Uh, yeah, it, come on, guys, it's it's <laughs> it's not rocket science. As a musician, I totally get it. <laughs> and and even um, James Horner. Everybody fixates on Titanic. I'm sorry, but there are pieces of uh, Braveheart, which he did Braveheart as well. He was the composer for Braveheart. That's in Titanic. I hate to break it to you, but he recycled too. <laughs> and also uh, John Williams. There's Star Wars in the Indiana Jones soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh I don't know why you pick on these people especially when you're not composing anything you're just there being a keyboard warrior don't do that <laughs> oh gosh now <laughs> I composed for a little bit I did my voice is going <laughs> but yeah I composed for a little while it's not as easy as you would think. It's not just putting little dots on the music. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot harder than you think. So just back off. <laughs> the, for the longest time, I thought that Gladiator was like a loose uh, remake of Spartacus, which is another one of my favorite movies. There was a there were are a lot of elements that you you when you watch it it does feel like Spartacus. I mean, especially when you look at like Laurence Olivier and and Derek Jacoby, and and uh, then of course uh, Kirk Douglas's character alongside uh, Russell Crowe's character and and all of that and there are enough differences to to not make it exact so nobody can say wait a minute <laughs> this is a rip off <laughs> and so imagine my surprise when i found out that this isn't a remake cuz like i said for years i thought that it was a remake and i was content with that because i like both movies i mean i'm i'm a fan of kirk douglas I enjoy Spartacus and the idea that uh, Russell Crowe was uh, a, a newer version of Kirk Douglas. And <laughs> so imagine my surprise to find out that it is based off of a book. Ridley Scott found this book uh, by Daniel P. Mannix. The same author for uh, Fox and the Hound, which I read that book when I was a kid. And um, so the book was released in 1958. Now, the, the book did change its title. Now, I believe, and I will correct myself in the description box, but I believe it was first released as Those About to Die, and then after Gladiator was released, it was released as The Way of the Gladiator. I don't know why they would do that. That doesn't make any sense. Just keep it as the original title. And of course, Daniel P. Mannix is long gone. But why change the title just because of this movie? That, that made no sense to me. It's not like Fox and the Hound came out and they changed the title. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the estate decided to do that and, and help boost sales of the book. Well, that would make sense. That makes more sense. Uh, one thing I found out was that with uh, Daniel P. Mannix, when he wrote the book, uh, he was on holiday in Rome and he saw the Colosseum and he just, he was inspired by this. And, and he wanted to write a story about, all, you know, the gladiators and everything. He started researching it. Of course, that's what we do, right? <laughs> uh, 
but I decided to look a little bit more into Daniel P. Mannix. I always just knew him as the writer of Fox and the Hound. Th this guy, <laughs> he was a sword swallower. He was a fire swallower. He traveled with sideshows. He was a photojournalist for a time. He was also like a professional hunter to the point. It sounds like he didn't actually kill the animals. He just trapped them and he would, uh, he did it for uh, zoos. Uh, he was a bird trainer. I think he had also said he did some animal training as well. And he was a professional stage magician. <laughs> he was a, a magic historian. He was also one of the original people who helped set up the uh, Munchkin Convention for uh, this Wizard of Oz club. I, I mean, <laughs> I was reading up on all this stuff that he did, and I'm just like, I, I, I wish I do. I, I love reading about. Uh, some of the things that these authors did it's like especially since it was almost like he's like yeah i'll, I'll do that I'll, I'll do that too i'll do that <laughs> and then he he just decided yeah i'm gonna write a book about this <laughs> just because <laughs> the sword swallowing through when i was uh, reading that it was like sword swallowing he did write a memoir about it the sword swallowing and the fire uh, swallow, or I guess it's a fire breathing or uh, whatever that is. Um, so, and, and he wrote several stories about traveling with the, the sideshows and circuses. So, um, but yeah, he had quite a life. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, But uh, it makes me wonder if he would, if he were still alive, if he would really appreciate this movie. Because <laughs> from what I understand, he, he really liked, he was alive when, uh, from what I understand anyway. Uh, what, when did he die? Let's look that up really quick. Because I didn't check that. Uh, da, 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 up. Because I have that. And it's. Well, where did he go? There he is. Yeah, he died in, oh, I was in high school. He died in 1997. So, so close. He died the same year as Titanic was released. So, but yeah, it, it makes you wonder if he would have enjoyed this movie. <laughs> I'd like to think he would have just from his adventurous life. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy hearing about people like that. It's kind of like, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, the, the nurse, I'm blanking on her name right now, but it, she was the, the nurse that was on the Titanic and then she went on the Lusitania and she was also on the Olympic when it, struck when it was struck and there was a an interview that I watched or I think it was the Britannic not not the Lusitania but um there was an interview that I watched with her niece and her niece talked about how she didn't how this particular nurse did not let these tragedies bring her down she was she adventured all over and in fact the the niece talked about how she had like this stuffed crocodile hanging from her, her, her ceiling and she said she had all kinds of knickknacks from all over the world all in her house she says I loved going to her house because it, it was just it was like a museum <laughs> Violet Jessup that was her name so anyway, I went off track a little bit there. So and uh, yeah, so that was uh, Daniel P. Mannix. He he seemed like a, an adventurous guy, and he was the one that wrote the book. And 
I think it was originally Those About to Die, and then after the movie came out, it, the title changed. I'll double check on that and, of course, correct myself on which was which. Now, <laughs> again, I, I love this movie, and of course, there are tons of inaccuracies. <laughs> Maximus didn't really exist. The thing about Maximus, that was a very common name in ancient Rome. And if a gladiator named Maximus accomplished what he did, it would have been written down. In fact, you think about it. If a gladiator had done that, had, had murdered the emperor, you know, had taken the life of a corrupt emperor in front of everybody in the Colosseum, we would have known about it. <laughs> I mean, we know about Nero and we know about Caligula. We know about Commodus, which we'll get to. I mean, there's so many, you go down the list and we know about all of these. And I would think that Mary Beard would do a special. I love Mary Beard. I absolutely adore her. She's she's so much fun to watch. But I would think that she would do a special. Honestly, I would know about the special if she uh, talked about Mark <laughs> Maximus, <laughs> the gladiator that <laughs> that is now in a blockbuster movie. Oh my goodness. Yes, I would be all over that. <laughs> like, speak to me, Mary. I'm watching. But no, Maximus was a very common name. And and if I'm sure that there were several gladiators named Maximus. But as for this hero, I haven't seen anything documented that says that that he did that there was a Maximus that did what was in the movie. So sad face, Maximus didn't really exist. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna stop loving the movie, but <laughs> it's also along the same lines. Quintus was the common name, you know, the the general that was in the movie. And yeah, there were several names used in the movie that were very common. Speaking of Marcus Aurelius was a real person. However, now it seems like I said in the last video that Marcus Aurelius died of a plague. No, he didn't. There was a plague that swept through during his reign, and uh, but he survived. <laughs> and no, he 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 didn't die of plague. Um. He did have a daughter, Lucilla, and of course his son, Commodus. This is where it gets a little weird for me. Uh, Lucilla married someone by the name of Lucius. Now in the movie, her son is named Lucius. So uh, I'm not sure why they decided to do that, but <laughs> but you know, in, in the mummy, in Brendan Fraser's The Mummy, of course I think it's also in uh, Boris, it's been a long time since I've seen Boris Karloff's version. Uh, they just use different names. I, I believe in Boris Karloff's, his character's name is Ardeth Bay. Uh, it's, uh, and, and then of course, the, the guy that's helping Brenda Fraser's group is Ardeth Bay. And yeah, yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen it. And then, of course, you hear Nox and Moon, and she's King Tut's wife, and then Imhotep. Well, we all know that Imhotep was adored. I mean, they, I mean, even the Romans and the Greeks loved him. They thought that he he they tried to make him immortal. They tried to make him a god. <laughs> when he died so now he wasn't a, a corrupt guy so yeah they were just using names to use names for the sake of entertainment and uh 
So I kind of feel like that's what happened here. And uh, <laughs> so when you look at the history side of it, it's like, oh my, <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> not good at all. Now, the Germanic War that was in the movie did in fact happen. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was well known for his, uh, <laughs> I don't know what other word for it, his soldiering, his, his warfare, that's the word I want, the, for his warfare <laughs> and everything. When he died, they, uh, the, the Romans put up a, a I can't believe I'm not coming up with words, but like a, they put up something in his memory. Let's just put that like a tribute, something or other. And so they put up a couple of things actually in, in tribute. And now his, his death was on, I'm not going to go into full detail of everything. I, I will put everything in the description box so you can read up on it. And uh, cause there were a lot of name changes that I was having a hard time keeping up with. <laughs> they they did changes. I guess that Lucius, his name was changed at one point and then it was changed back. Now, uh, Lucilla uh, did have, uh, uh, Lucius did die and then she had another husband. So that was kind of, I'm, well, now that I think about it, now that I'm, looking at it now maybe Lucius in the movie was named after his dad that was not uncommon so uh, it's not so weird now that I look at it so um from that standpoint <laughs> from yes let's think of it that way it's, it's not weird <laughs> it's okay now <laughs> yeah and uh Lucilla was thrown in exile over something uh it didn't really make sense to me uh Apparently she had betrayed the family and yeah, was, <laughs> exile to them was throwing them on an Island somewhere. <laughs> and, but her first husband had died and then there was her second husband. I don't know what happened. So I'm going to put all this in the description box, but yeah, uh, when it comes to Marcus Aurelius, his, he died, he was in his 50s. It was unknown what happened. Now, it did say that Commodus, when he took over, it was the, only the second time that a birth child inherited everything, which I found interesting. Usually it was an adopted child took took over i'm like how how did what is going on in rome <laughs> i'm uh okay of course you have uh agrippina uh nero's mom and she was really really pushing to have uh I think it was Claudius, have Claudius adopt Nero. And Claudius wanted Britannicus. He was starting to favor Britannicus. And that's what made all the shit hit the fans. So. <laughs> but <laughs> so yeah, uh, Nero was an adopted and that's for another video for another time. So Commodus, <laughs> now the interesting thing about Commodus is that unlike the movie where we see him as this eccentric you know <laughs> overly eccentric <laughs> let's just say that when I was reading on some of the things some of the accounts of what people said about him they said yeah he was a bit cowardly. So I, I could tell that Ridley Scott was using either 
it's uh, from the book or, you know, that Daniel P. Mannix used what he could from, or Ridley Scott did some extra research because there was, of course, that one scene right before he and, and Maximus fight and, and uh, he says, Maximus says to him, I think you've been running all your life. And so there, I mean, there are several accounts where they say, well, he has a pleasant personality, but he's still kind of cowardly, you know? <laughs> he kind of goes with the flow. He, he, he doesn't stand up for himself, that, that kind of deal. So he's, it sounds like he wasn't eccentric at all. He, he just kind of stood in the shadows and let others decide for him. And now he did, he did hold games like what we saw in the movie. He actually participated in them. He was known to be a gladiator. And now the thing was, is from what I've read on several accounts, <laughs> is that there was, he was going to execute, he was going to do like this execution thing and, and all that. And one person found out that they were going to be executed and that's when they decided to assassinate Commodus. And so they hired this one person and it was actually the person that was going to wrestle Commodus and that's who killed Commodus in the bathtub. <laughs> I always thought that it was a juggler for some reason, either a juggler or another gladiator, but no, it was a wrestler. And so that, that's why I always say that Ridley Scott gave Commodus a, a more dignified. <laughs> and <laughs> Oh, good heavens. I just, I absolutely love this movie. I, I really do. It has its inconsistencies, a lot of inconsistencies. And I think one of the best songs in it is Now We Are Free. And I actually, I recently found uh, a, a remix of, oh, um, shoot. Like, have it all here <laughs> give me a second here yeah it was a uh, juba's remix now i love the character juba he's one of my favorite in there and because <laughs> i feel like in in the movie you know because you have uh gratchis i believe that's his name uh, gratchis give me a sec uh yeah, Gratchus. I said it right. <laughs> Lots of Roman names, and but um, that's the one played by Derek Jacoby. And you have Gratchus, and yeah, he gives some advice and everything, but he still has to stay within the rules of uh, Emperor Commodus. So, but with Juba, he he gives advice and he's the one he, he helps. He sees potential in, in, in Maximus and he knows that Maximus is a fighter and, and can go all the way. If that makes sense. <laughs> I like Juba. I like Juba a lot. I think that was a good solid character. And I will also put in the, if I can find it, I will put in the description box, the Juba's remix. If you haven't heard it, it it's a good remix. And, um, but anyway, I think I'm gonna stop it here. <laughs> Sorry about the original <laughs> being so bad that you can't listen. I didn't realize it was that bad, but hopefully this is a lot better. <laughs> <laughs>